beginning semester, I see some new faces. I hope this will be a good first colloquium for you. Uh, this is probably the last colloquium before the uh, puja break. So we will come back after puja uh, after this. Um, so we are uh, very happy to have Dr. Tafel Shaha as the speaker today. Uh, like many, most speakers of this colloquium, Tafel is an alumnus of uh, uh, presidency. He did his BSc from 2014 to 2017 and MSc from 2017 to 2019, where he did the astrophysics uh, advanced uh, paper. So after his MSc here, uh, Dr. Agato went to Nicholas Copernicus Astronomical Center in Warsaw, uh, Poland, and did his PhD with uh, Dr. Alex Markowitz. Um, and did very rigorous work on uh, on uh, uh, <laughs> obscuration and so on. So you will, you will hear about that after his after finishing his PhD in um, which was last year. Uh, well, earlier this May year. So he defended. He, he submitted last year, but defended this year, uh, in which some of us have, were present online. Uh, uh, after, after finishing that, he is a uh, visiting researcher at uh, Leibniz Institute for Astrophysics in Potsdam, Germany. And, uh, but luckily, he is also staying in Kolkata, so he can give a talk here. So Tathagato is, uh, like his advisor, is a good match with Alex Markovich because both of them are very rigorous scientists. When Tafagato worked with me in his uh, undergrad and uh, postgrad thesis, uh, unlike the standard teacher student dynamic where the teacher wants to be more rigorous and the students want to be, you know, more free flowing and sort of, uh, you know, wants to be done. Uh, it was the opposite. I used to sort of beg Tafagato to finish a project because he always wanted to be more rigorous and I wanted to be more like, back of the envelope, and that, that still goes on. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll hope to hear a very rigorous work about the obscuration. So, uh, and so we also heard that Alex is also very rigorous and interesting. That's the thing, that Alex yes. is a good match. And both of you share the same birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Alex has also the same birthday. So, so if Alex yes. says happy birthday, I can say same to you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so Alex is also very, very rigorous uh, in terms of science, so it's a, it's a good match. So, Tata. Yeah, uh, thank you, Arsi, sir, for the very kind introduction. And uh, video panel, control panel. Mm -hmm. No, isn't it? There you go. I think it's a phone of which you can obscure for the Okay, uh, thank you, Arsisar, for the very kind introduction. Uh, it's an honor to be a speaker here where I have been a student for five years and I have learned a lot here in this department. A lot of science, a lot of a lot of other stuff, which is which is which has helped me very much during my PhDs. So uh, today my topic is morphology of circumnuclear accreting gas in active galactic nuclei. So a significant part of this talk is a part of my PhD thesis, and, and uh, it covers two divergent topics uh, in, in AGN. So here's a brief outline. Uh, so I first begin with a brief introduction to AGN substructures, different kind of substructures uh, present in an active galactic nuclei. And then I move to the first topic, uh, which is heavy obscuration in AGN. And this is this is where I test some of uh, some of uh, the X-ray obscuration models of uh, of active gal galactic nuclei. And the second part of this talk would feature uh, AG 
Asia and France Wales, mostly changing look Asians. So there I discussed two different uh, changing look Asians, um, a deep study of both of these two. And then I moved into the conclusion and outlook that we came from, from, the, from the top. So uh, active galactic nuclei is powered by accretion on the supermassive planets. And this process of accretion results in formation of multiple substructures. At the very core uh, center, we have the accretion disk and the Asian corona, uh, which is which is much closer in a few RG, uh, few a few hundred RG uh, length scale. So this is the most energetically dominant part of the Asian, and it emits mostly thermal uh, thermal optical and UV in form of thermal optical UV continuum. And the corona is the main X-ray emitter of this of this of the system. So these, for the sake of this talk, I call them primary emitters. A little bit further, uh, in the subparsec scale, we have the broad line region, which emits uh, the Doppler broadened uh, emission lines of H beta and H H alpha. And in the parsec scale, we have the we have the thick dusty torus, which is not here. And far, farther outside in the kiloparsec scale, you have the narrow line region and many other different sorts of outflows and, uh, uh, and things that are emitted from the central region of the, of the region, which mo mostly emit in, narrow, in form of narrow forbidden emission lines. And then there are jets, which are present in a in only a few percent of Asian, and it, for in this talk we'll mo mostly focus in the focus on the uh, on the Asians which don't have which don't have jets that is seabirds. So the first part of the talk would be focused on one of those reprocessors which is the Asian torus, and. In this part, we'll test different sort of X-ray spectral models that have been developed over the past decades that has been used by the community to analyze uh, heavy, heavily obscured Compton thick AGNs. So uh, the torus is basically a dusty structure which reprocesses the central radiation and re-emits mostly in infrared and in X-ray. So the corona illuminates illuminates the torus and a part of it gets absorbed, a part of it gets reprocessed and you get what, what you see in an obscured system. So uh, initially the torus was thought to be something of a, of a continuous nature, which is represented by the, uh, by the donor as shown here. Uh, but however, this has been, this, this continuous nature of the torus has been uh, contradicted in, in different multiband studies, such as in infrared, we have different sort of uh, different uh, features like the uh, silicate absorption or emission lines and uh, the nature of the continuum LCDs. Also, in the X rays, we see uh, some we see uh, distinct eclipses in X ray light curves, which indicate that the torus is more of a clumpy nature than a single continuous distribution. So uh, because of this, because of the uh, different, because of the structure of the torus, the radiative transfer has, inside the torus has, has uh, some, there is some implication on the radiative transfer. So uh, different kinds of torus has diff uh, different, geometry of torus has different types of, uh, types of, uh, Obscured spectrum, and this is indicative. So these these uh, these models these uh, these models are indicative of uh, of obscured black hole growth. So the conclusions that we make from make from these uh, from these sort of models are dependent on dependent on them, and our conclusions on obscured black, black hole growth and the cosmic extra background is thus dependent on these models. So for the X-ray studies, uh, simple models of the Asian torus has been developed to analyze data, data in the Compton thick regime. And 
in this study, we'll, we'll see how these models behave given the current level, current uh, observation, observational uh, state of the, of the extra observatories. So, uh, You would see them in optical also. So there is actually a correlation. Sorry for not being clear. So uh, obscured means in X-rays, the spectrum would be absorbed. Correspondingly in the optical, you will see narrow line C curves. So basically the broad emission lines will be absent. Because basically you are talking type 2. Type 2, yeah. So or some intermediate type. <laughs> so here you have the broad line region which emits this broad gamma emission lines. If you see through here, you will not be able to see, see the broad gamma emission lines that are coming. So, so you just the I guess the confusion partly is in the in terms of sort of cosmological AGN evolution or galaxy evolution point of view. It's not just a torus shaped obscuration, but just a general dust shrouding of the central engine. Is that part of your discussion? No, you are discussing mostly torus shaped obscuration. Mostly torus shaped obscuration. So, I mean, of course, there is a lot of gas around here. We'll have some obscuration at some level. Uh, even the host galaxy will have some obscuration. Right. We are not, uh, we are not uh, considering that. that. So, it's just what. The, the obscuration that is intrinsic to the agent. And mostly covering the central region, but not the... the not the much... So this complicated structure is now simplified into these. Uh, so... Various simple uh, agent torus models have been developed over the past decade, and we try to we, we try to check that given the the data quality, can we distinguish these simple, simple models for, let's say, the best quality instruments that are available, XMM Newton and Mu star, XMM Newton in the softer band, Mu star in the harder band, for typical values of fluxes which are representative of nearby concentric gradients. For example, the most Famous two objects of the Circinus galaxy and uh, NGC 1068. So our flux values are representative of that. So we asked two basic questions. So are the parameters of the torus, for example, the level of uh, the level of obscuration, the level of absorption, and the covering fraction recovered, along with the central engine parameters like the photon index of the X-ray corona, the electron temperature, etc. And can at this data data quality can we distinguish these models by statistical methods? So to do that, we first assume a simple model of a compensating agent which has only a few components. So you have the absorbed continuum, which is the part of emission that gets absorbed in the torus. It's, it's also called the direct component. So that's just photoelectric absorption of the coronal power law. And uh, we also have the reflected continuum, which is basically a Compton scatter component, which has which undergoes multiple scattering in the torus and forms something called a Compton hump. So here in red, uh, here in red, we have the zero order continuum or absorbed continuum or photo photoelectric absorbed component. And the blue dashed line here is the Compton scatter component. So, or the Compton hump. In addition to that, 
we have a soft scatter component, which is here in magenta. I hope color is visible. <clears throat> which is basically scattering from distant material, and this part is unobscured, so it just comes out as a simple power law. Or it's material that is uh, that's originating from the interclump gas if the torus is clumpy. So we add this together along with some. Yeah. <coughs> like really like narrow line regions are in kilopartic scale. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, line. so if you go here, torus is about 110 to 100 percent. And the narrow line we have about so this the three So we add this all up along with some soft impurity type components, which are modeled by EPEC here. Uh, and we get what is called the theoretical model, the, the, the simple theoretical model of the of an obscure region, of a heavily obscure region. So uh, these are then passed through XMM and new star responses. We expose this to the to these instruments via uh, uh, internal experiment. We perform this uh, perform this analysis in analysis in one of the pack extra astronomical packages called expect and we get a uh, response convoluted spectrum that is what the instrument observes. So we we also we we then fit this simulated data using Bayesian methods. So we use BXA multinest and we perform two different kinds of analysis. So we perform an intramodal fit, which is when the simulation model and the fitting model are the same. And then we perform cross-model fits where, where uh, the simulation model and the fitting model are different. So in the first case, we, te we test how the parameters are recovered in the context of the correct or correct input model. And in the second case, we test model distinguishability and different sorts of discrepancy that might arise because we have selected a different model under which the data has been simulated. So we also test for two different regimes, uh, a little, something which is a bit heavy and also some in the in the medium Compton thick regime, for all cases we select uh, we select flat priors which are either uniform or log uniform, and the likelihood in this case is uh, C-stat or Poisson statistics in expect. We are interested mostly in posteriors and the Bayesian evidence, which are important for model distinguishability and testing parameter degeneracy. So uh, this is an example of uh, an intramodal fit where the fitting model and the simulation model are the same. So this is for one model called UX Clumpy. So, so this is one of the more complicated models in the bunch where the matter, where the clumps are distributed following a Gaussian distribution about this equatorial thing. So you have more clumps towards the equator than towards the and that distribution, the stigma of the Gaussian, that's the standard deviation of the Gaussian deviation. And also in the model, you have um, an ad hoc inner ring at the very center. And uh, this has its own covering fraction. So when you add the noise to the model. <laughs> noise to the model. I mean, there is, when we perform simulations, there is definitely poison noise for, uh, in the data. So that is yes. yes. Uh, so our results are mostly in form of posteriors, as shown here. So we have the input value, which is given by the red line here, and the median of the posteriors is this green line, and the dashed lines are the. Uh, 90% confidence boundaries for, for these. These are the posteriors of your model. 
Gamma. So, that's an age. So, NH is absorption of the force. Okay. Gamma is the photon index of the central, which is uh, the X ray that is that is emitted central from the from the core of it. And then other parameters here is sigma is this one, and covariance fraction is covariance fraction of these two. So, these are the two morphological parameters of the and to that you should be able to do so so this is actually generated by analyzing this is a bxl posterior generated by analyzing the uh, synthetic data that's simulated in the context of this movement that's us one so uh, there is different degrees of accuracy that we get on these parameters for example in this case the line of sight absorption is recovered pretty nicely, pretty well, pretty well. Almost we recovered the input side. Similar case for gamma. So the, the errors are mostly between two to three percent, and it will remain almost the same if you perform hundred instances of the same simulation. However, the other morphological parameters we find that there is large statistical uncertainties. In this, in this model, that is, the parameter space is more dependent on the line of sight absorption and the gamma than those morphological parameters. So you end up having this this kind of this kind of high uh, statistical uncertainties. So this has impact on studies which are performing all this covering fraction measure, measuring this covering fraction from different qualities of data, which necessarily might not be from external Newton or Neuster or maybe from other instruments. So here is another example from what is known as cross model. So in this case, we, uh, we have uh, a different fitting model than the simulation. So this is again in the medium quantum fit regime. So we, we have cases where we take uh, this uh, as the input. And we see that mostly due to the presence of a consistent uh, iron K edge here, the line of sight absorption is recovered pretty well. Also, with what is the morphological difference? For example, okay, so here the input is US long. So we fit with four other different models. There is my torus, there is Boras, there is RX torus, and there is C torus. So if we go back here, so this is my torus. So this is, we are trying to now interpret my torus in context. Of, no, yeah, we're, yeah, we are trying to explain US company in the context of my torus. And then there is C torus, which is another clumpy model. And also Boras, which is sort of a uh, biconical style. And I think uh, Zuboda has yes. uh, used this model quite a lot. And one of the differences that I should mention between the modeling here and what Zuboda did was in this case, the morphology is preserved. Like we do not decouple the different components, they are not independent. So they are coupled. So there is a mathematical relation between the line of sight absorption and what. The and the general general average NH that is present here. So there is they, they, they are not independent in this case. So, so here the interpretation, interpretation is how donut behaves in the context of this one. So uh, a few universal trends. Uh, NH is recovered pretty well. So you have the KH. Have the KH here, which <clears throat> which is almost similar for all the models, and there is some differences, but that just results in a few, uh, like about at most ten percent of ten percent discrepant, not very discrepant considering line of sight absorption. Whereas in gamma, the photon index, so we are quite different. Uh, we are quite discrepant in these cases because 
in general photon index as i will explain later uh, is a very important property of the central engine so it it uh, it it is the heating to cooling ratio in the agent core mass so this so this sort of discrepancy from 1.6 and 1.6 and 1.9 they are like very different considering the importance of this parameter so this this discrepancy comes because of the region that constraints come up, which is mostly the Compton hump plus the uh, transmitted component region. So the, comp the Compton hump is really different for different models, and that results in a lot of uncertainty, systematic errors on the volumetric luminosity of this, this kind of sources, which are generally uh, estimated via K corrections of the of the coronal power law or the direct component. So we don't have uh, enough time to explain the parameter for two models. Right. Now we should get and some of them are same. Yes. But others are not the same. Yes. So basically, so one of the things that will be impacted very much, and I'll come to that later, uh, is that uh, the covering fractions are like they are affected very much by uh, by the selection of the models. So one of the models will return one value of covering fraction, other will be different. So if you and also, for example, if you use RX torus, where the thickness of the donor. That is something which is going to vary in the context of US clumpy in a different way in the context of others. No, you don't know. That's a problem. You, you don't know that it's correct. No. If I have produced the simulation with this model, I would need that uh, photon in. I cannot produce with the same photon index with this model. That is that is what I'm pointing at. There is a degeneracy. That's a problem. And we don't have a solution to that. Means I, I, uh, I cannot distinguish between which model is right. That's what your statement is. Yes. So, is that idea of doing a degeneracy? Yes. So, we can't find so, based on the posteriors, we cannot. Then we come to model distinguishability. So this is where uh, we try to distinguish these these different kinds of models using a parameter called base time. So this this is one of the tests that you can perform to see which model is more consistent with the data than the other ones. So we have this six set of models. You fit it to the same data, perform some simulations, and calculate base time. So here I do the same. So there is. So here the. This is the definition of base factor. We have uh, the Bayesian evidence of the fit model. So this is something that's returned from the BXM artist runs. So the Bayesian scheme gives a value of base for base factor of Bayesian evidence, and we we see that how this we test how this. Uh, base factor values uh, differ in in different levels of flux for different models, different combination of models. So here I have the a variation of base factor with respect to flux. So uh, these levels are kind of important. So log base factor equals zero means indistinguishability. Loss, log base factor greater than zero, it's it means a wrong selection in this in this definition. And when we when it's more negative, it's more distinguishable. So on the x-axis you have flux. So f is uh, 0.5 milligram. So if we go down flux, we go we de decrease flux by an order. So we find that base factor becomes less and less negative as we move down in flux levels. Oh, I didn't get it. Yeah. Yeah. 
So the data is simulated under this model. Let's just see those. And we fit it with both two models different. and axes. Yes. Okay. Okay. So this is how the base factor varies for different levels of class for this input. And put in class class only mixture. So we this is where I check how uh, XLM and new new star XLM plus new star is better than this one. So, so the have, green and the red dash line. Yeah, the so uh -huh. this is indistinguishable. So this is where the indistinguishable line. So you see that there is when you have gone down uh, in degrees of freedom. So new star means less degrees of only new star means less degrees of freedom. There are less bins in new star. So you end up much closer towards uh, this. Yeah. I think there's a wrong one. No, it's green is indistinguishable. Red is greater than the wrong factor. Wrong selection. Okay, there should be a red line. The zone. So, yeah, so this is the long selection. So, above zero is long selection. This is also called or just the one that is. No, this is these are all obscure slides. But is that is the one smaller or less smaller? So this is not a spectrum. So no, this is a spectrum. Yeah. This is a spectrum. Just the Bayesian, uh, like the uh, okay. deep deep model. No, no, sorry. Yes, sorry. So then, what am I supposed to learn? So, so what happens from these two top plots is that if you have a seat order <laughs> kind of thing, you should try to fit it with ux, sorry, ux clumpy or boras into what? Or what is what is the pipeline? So this? here, definitely, if you want to make, if you want to distinguish this model, it's always better to have. XML plus new star. So when you write proposals, you should always go for this. And this one is, of course, you have to, like this will this will cover the content hump region. This is one of the more important regions of the, of the, of the spectrum. Of the, yeah, of the content spectrum. However, if you for this one, you will cover both the soft and the hard regions and the KH properly, because you have more counts in XML in the KH region. That's why you have a more distinguishable. Uh, you have more distinguishable with, with these two. I understand. But that's the general idea that should yeah. be in general without uh, doing anything. Yeah. I have more, more uh, data, yeah. more uh, uh, power and yeah. wider I range of data. I will have to distinguish it. Also, uh, in, in the context, the modeling, yeah, but we in the context of the torus, so you also have one of these. Uh, soft scattered component here. So, the, so now I'm going in, into the much more deeper part. So the soft scattered component, and you find that there is this uh, uh, Compton hump, and this one has a tail around this region. So because these two are almost are in the same regions, so there would be some levels of degeneracy. And these le these uh, parts of the spectrum, so for example, the Compton hump, this is influenced by <laughs> in the context of only one model. So all these models will have a different different sort of different behavior. So the when you have more le more uh, uh, more covering fraction uh, in, of the of the clump distribution, you will end up with lesser amount of uh, this tail, and thus this will assume some higher higher value. This uh, soft scattered component would have assume some higher values. So if you have an XMM data, you will be able to capture that degeneracy, or capture or break that degeneracy with with that instrument. So and when proposal uh, write proposal, they should go for a join. Start yes, and at certain flux level, also the flux level is kind of. So, very bright process only will also 
for, for very very right yes uh, and for, i mean so you are talking about the parcel right so if the food is right and will only a lifted observation be used uh, to help in getting nutrients in the water so the lifted is going to be at least in 5 to 10 times so the plus is like minus 30 in f and whereas uh, okay. when you have a Two F, you have minus two goes up to minus three hundred. Yes. The factor of improvement of sixty ten. It does have distinguishing. Thank you. Yeah, the basic factor you are defining with the um, FTP model. This model is what uh, by which you have uh, produced. Uh, you are trying to see. Yes. Input model is a different one. Input model is a different one. I mean, that, I mean, I also pick with the input model, but in that case, it will be like it will. This will be same. But then, what do you mean by indistinguishable? Of course, you cannot distinguish a, the input model with the input model because it's the same model. So, so that it's it's so that is the reference line. So when you when you kind of uh, when you try to compare, you need to select a reference. So, uh, so let's say I have a, a higher class. Why are the Bayesian uh, base factor is let's say minus hundred or so? I have obtained that. Yes. So that means that my treated model is wrong. No, am I am I uh, if I understand correctly? Uh, the what this plot is telling me that suppose. My intrinsic model is T torus, yes. and I try to fit them with UX clumpy or bodas. How much would I be able to distinguish that I have done yes. a mistake or not? Yes. Is that what yes. you're trying to see here? Yeah. So in real data, of course, yeah. you, you end up with only this. So in that case, you need to select one of these as the reference. Yeah. So in this case, Maybe the experiment would have been better if we had a blind fitting and you don't you have not known what the input what model is. Is. And again, in this means let's say I'm doing this I squared thing. That's what this fitting is uh, some kind of I squared. You have similar values of I squared. So that is indistinguishable with I squared. However, Bayesian analysis, this base factor it takes in another another uh, another uh, characteristics of the spectrum. Which is the Occam's razor, which is also quantified through the through the base factor. Well, I uh, understand that, but uh, so if I fit it, the base factor will tell me that this is not a good fit. I I'm, uh, I have I don't have I don't have the information about what model it has been taken. Right? Let's say for observation, <laughs> real observation, some data are given. Okay, now I will fit with these two models, any two models. I will get a base factor from there. Yes. Then that will be able to distinguish between the, which model is better. That will be. Uh, in what way? I don't understand this. So, so that you, can, have... you can always have a bit, good fit with more parameters. Correct. But uh, if you try the same experiment, so in chi square, some model gives a better value of chi square. So it's a better fit than the other one. But there might be cases where you have a Similar. better value of chi square, but when you run a Bayesian analysis, base factor might be better for the other because that has more optimized parameters. Somewhere you have been like over parameterize the, the better fit. What is the Z then? But Z is the Bayesian evidence. So Bayesian evidence can also be used for this kind of uh, uh, so this kind of distinguishing. Z, Z, Z takes in sorry, Z uh, involves both like a chi square fitting kind of thing, whether that is good, but also how many parameters you are using, etc. Yes. So that's a likelihood kind of thing. So this is kind of like yes, yes, kind of course. So you have the likelihood <coughs> inside the base factor, which is a function of this one, the parameter space. And here you have the volume part, which is basically your Occam's razor. So you have 
the volume yeah, parameter. So this, is, yeah. Yeah. so this is what Bayesian engineering is. So when you do basic chi square fitting, you use just this. So this part is generally not rigorously considered. <laughs> Therefore, you should always use base factor than uh, single fitting. So this is the point I want to make. And particularly when you have degeneracy. Particularly when you have degeneracy and resistance. Degeneracy and when you are using different models with different number of parameters, which is very common. Very common. Okay. Please go ahead. Can we use AI? Huh? Can we use AI? Hmm. AI. So we need to train those models first. So that will be different case. <laughs> yeah. So we need to train yeah. this in the context of all those models. See, we are really quick when you are doing the analysis. We don't use the information about how you have produced the model. Do you use it in this these analysis? No, not yet. But all these models actually take into account some or the other radiative transfer code to generate the spectrum. No, no. While using the Bayesian analysis part, you give the input as what model has been used to generate the effect. No, 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 no. 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 So basically, when you have the data set, you, let's for that time you just forget about what the model had, you just use that. that. Okay. Okay. So no, I, I would like to answer it more about this. No, no, yeah, move on. Uh, and then, like, lost the continuity. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, uh, yeah, so I have shown how uh, base, fa base factor uh, is dependent on class and on the degrees of freedom and what should be taken into account when you write proposals, maybe selection of class values and exposures, everything. And then I see how this base factor varies statistically. So here I select, I have performed multiple simulations at a given flux level with one model, that's, that's UX slumpy, and then fit it with UX slumpy and my <laughs> And you get a distribution of base factor, which is a function of the poison noise, the noise that's that's giving the spectra, spectrum uh, generation. That is to say that you have two different flux values, so 0.5 and 0 0.05. At one stage, you see that for multiple spectra, how the base factor is distributed, and then you go drop flux by an order and see how that that base factor is used. And so this is the, the distribution as plotted here. So for low counts, you get this, this red histogram. And for high counts, you get this histogram. So you see that in low flux, so there is like a few fraction, a fraction of the spectrum results in wrong selection in this, in this. Uh, that is, it crosses the log base factor for zero power line on this, on this. So it means that these random fluctuations in the base factor can also result in wrong model selection. So you should always supplement your real analysis with simulations, with multiple simulations of uh, of the model under which you are doing the fit and. Maybe create some sort of confusion matrix using the base factor. So this is all about model distinguishability. So here is the summary of the first part. So for those who perform, who use this Torus model, so there is I have demonstrated the different sorts of systematics that are associated with the fitting, and we do check the impact of wrong model assumptions. That is in form of discrepancy and uh, different sorts of uh, and discrepancy in the model in in the central limit parameters and in coverage fractions. And one of the things that we understand is that there is a severe limitation in sing single epoch spectral analysis when we try to infer 
uh, morphology of the GM products. So it is subject to all this, all this uh, systematics. So uh, one one way out could be we could support we can we can have some additional information which is from imaging and also now we have polarimetry so these can also have hint at some of the properties of the and some of which are morphological and we should perform much more multivalent fits which are what well, that is to include infrared and optical band because there is uh, more just more counts in those in those band and now with the presence of uh, radiative transfer and different sort of very pressing model we can make our own models and if you are not happy with the models that are already published so that's the summary of the first step so i can answer some more questions yeah i can Okay, uh, so the second part of my research covers uh, supermassive black hole transients, which are basically extreme changes in the accretion flow. So agents in general are variable objects. So uh, they vary by a factor of Q to a factor of 10, it's two percentage depending on the current bands. And in some cases we see that there are large flux changes either in optical and in X-ray. So, uh, and these things are observed across different time scales, that is from few years to few months to a few days. In most cases, these large changes are tied to uh, large spectral changes, that is as shown here. So this is one of the sources, which was once a type one, underwent a flux drop, and now it's a type two object. So, so these are the broad things of who so it was once a type two, type one point eight rather. Now it's a, a type one object. So it did not have a bro broad uh, H beta emission line and H gamma emission line. So now, uh, so in twenty thirteen, it's appears like this. So there is a large increase in uh, so these type of sources are known as uh, changing loop agents. And I mostly focus, I mostly focus on these uh, on the changing loop agents. Whereas for the sake of complete, completeness, I just mentioned that there are other things, other uh, transient supermassive black hole transients called tidal disruption agents, which are seen in agents also, also in the normal galaxies. So so this is an object which uh, which I I worked on. Uh, I performed a multi wavelength follow up of this object. So this was uh, detected in both optical using the Zwicky transient facility and also Eros data. However, that it was caught during the uh, during during the shutdown phase when. When the object went clearing and it's it was already dissipated. And this is changing look or no? Yeah. So, this one. so CTF saw this, uh, observed this and observed this object and found that there is a there is a clear uh, in the source, and this clear coincided with uh, one of the with the type change that's shown here. That is incidentally because of that. Even that sudden increase in flux, there was an observation, and we found that there is uh, there is uh, there is appearance of uh, uh, H beta and H beta and H alpha emission line, which where the H beta was initially absent in uh, old spect archival spectrum from six years. Both of them are broad line or. This is broad line, this is broad line, and this one all had a H alpha but no H beta. But H alpha was broad line. Yes, yes. Yes, so it's still broad but a little less. Right? I mean, this is actually a count spectrum, so we cannot compare class. No. So I, since I plotted it in the same, but I made it out of the same. But I thought you were like to. 
appear narrow lines or uh, appear on the broad line? So narrow lines are always present because narrow right. lines do not change in those time scales. Uh, but the only broad thing that line had a broad line. We had only H alpha. We didn't have H beta. H beta was not present. That's why it was a type 1.9 AGM. And then in this Keck observation from 2020, it's a type 1. I don't remember actually. Are you saying that we don't have a H beta? What's the reason? You have only H alpha and you don't have H beta. What's the general influence of that? So, well, uh, H alpha is more, H beta is more responsive. So, this is what I will be going to. Okay. It's a higher continuum can cause H beta. That's what I'm saying. That's not a changing loop to me. That was my point. No, no, but you already heard the previous talk, right? So, the changing loop. Can be both. One is where lines are appearing, disappearing, but also just a large change of continuum, continuum state. That is also considered changing loop. I think now, uh, I think they have said changing look and changing state or changing of state, something like that. So, so different changing look also has classification. That's what ADHD is the stellar classification, the galaxy classification. Yeah, you can ask at the end. Yeah, but you can still give us. Okay. So, H beta broad emission here, and also this this was followed with Swift, and Erosita observed this during its all sky scans, and we see almost. Long term, where this part is supposedly the uh, end part of the flare in X rays and UVs, and uh, yeah, and the second flare appears <laughs> later. So, uh, this is uh, an example of uh, multi weapon variability. Oh, also, uh, the wise bands vary, you have broad uh, response from the infrared wise bands also due to uh, due to this flare and uh, yeah we followed this object for three years and uh, gathered a lot of optical spectrum so here you see how h beta h beta initially it was bright and then as the flare subsided it uh, h beta kind of uh, significantly dropped in flux and uh, h beta h alpha on the other hand it's mostly it's mostly persistent and it it does not it does not disappear even though h, alpha, h beta has disappeared so uh, in the the continuum in the later part of the spectrum is mostly dominated by the galaxy although in the initial part you see some blue blue continuum here and the narrow emission lines are always there so so there is an active narrow line region in this source for so uh if you look carefully there's also each gamma uh, yes i i think that's right yeah so this is also very but it's yeah, it's, you say that yeah, it's, it's uh, like the the confidence level is kind of low the signal to noise is low for each uh, each gamma yeah. so you can't say that. But this one, this one is too noisy to say. So, uh, so this source has a double peak broad emission line. This source has a double peak broad emission line and uh, we modeled this using a disk line model and we were able to uh, constrain some uh, some parameters of the of the 
for your parameters of the emitter. So it's mostly uh, it's mostly a uh, disk which is which ranges within a few hundred RGs to uh, to thousand RGs with an inclination of about T. So also we find that the emission line tracks very well with the very well this this continuum that's the X-rays and the and the UV continuum. So one of the most important features of this source is that this source misses a soft excess, which is kind of a very prominent uh, feature of all type uh, type one AGNs, unobscured AGNs, and it also doesn't. It's not also uh, obscured. So the gamma, the uh, photon index of this source, is about one point seven to one point nine, and this is consistent with X-ray and UV tracking each other and probably hot optimization is dominant in this <laughs> source. This also exhibits some short-term variability within within a few months, few day in on day time scales as shown here, which also tracks each other. So uh, as the absence of soft excess is either due to uh, the absence of a warm continuous corona or somewhere that uh, when we interpret this in terms of ionized reflection, so we don't, we have a large part of the inert basin, which is mostly dominated by, which most happens when the inner part is dominated by a hot flow. So, uh, so the light curve doesn't particularly exhibit a very strong abrupt rise and then a slow decay. And the photon index is also kind of flat. So this is a very strong, evidence of the source not being powered by a tidal disruption event. So this is also confirmed by our VPT diagrams, which indicate that the source has also been active for, for a long time. So one possible mechanism that might be driving this, this uh, extreme variability to flare could be uh, uh, disk instability, which is uh, proposed by Lightman and Beardley in one of his papers, in uh, one of the early papers, and then under, and has been simulated in multiple case, in multiple papers later. And this, this shows that, and these simulations show that a lot of uh, flares can be generated in consistently in, in, a, in a limit cycle method. Uh, <clears throat> For different parameters of the of the accretion disk, so our player exhibits a time loosely exhibits a time scale which is consistent with the thermal time scale for a uh, ten to the eight solar mass black hole, and if an instability occurs at uh, somewhat around uh, a few tens of RGs, so a player like this might be possible. Mm -hmm. So this is all consistent with flare times. So a summary of this, of the whole sequence of events is that the instability might have caused uh, some uh, increase in the UV luminosity, which increased the compromising seed in the, in the corona, which increased the optical. And hence we have, we have the appearance of broad H beta and H beta emission line and almost similar variability of sig alpha. So there is the dust echo also originates due to the increase of the central emitting radiation. So it's reprocessing in the central, reprocessing in the dust structure. And now as we monitor the source <coughs> continuously, so this is in the flare has already ended and it's the, the source is in a subdued state. So any questions? Yes, like uh, currently, uh, currently there has been discussions on the applicability of mo similar models like this. This is one of the models that are available. So the simulation started around in 19... Uh, 90s with uh, so we have this uh, instability branch 
if you if you kind of uh, model if you have you have to, these two parameters for example your temperature here and the, the, this this surface density so what happens is there is that there is a limit cycle so the so the source transits along this branch and then suddenly when it uh, is at this edge so it moves to the upper branch which is the unstable branch and then goes to it and comes back again so this transition so this is a property of the accretion disk so in agns these uh, if there is radiative pressure instabilities which is in many cases this kind of uh, instabilities are shown and this is one of the models of a lot of changing loop ages that we are seeing now. So many, so we try to explain many uh, changing loop ages using this model because you see there is a a lot of time scales that are being covered with uh, the parameters that are uh, that are being used here yeah. in, in this particular yeah. case. Yeah. So. The one problem is with the flare, flares, and, uh, the shape of the flare. So that's also something that we can, uh, can be looked at. Yeah. Well, it seems like everything happening at linear time. So here it's really two years. Yeah, there is a lot. If you, if you can play around with these parameters, you can get a good result. What happening over what it is? I mean, in any case, this is thirty percent change, right? Yeah, thirty percent change in an in an AGN is very very tough. That has happens all the time. Thirty percent what? No, so this is just in optical. But the X rays were, I think, twenty uh, factor of twenty. But that doesn't matter. X rays are the other thing. If you do UV, I'll. See, this is the change in disk we are looking at, right? Yes, uh, I mean, yeah, O band, which is uh, mostly this. Um, so if, if it is optical band, atlas O band, it will be thirty percent in UV. What do you expect? Let's say hundred percent, right? Doubling the flux. Doubling the flux in AGN is very common and happens at different time scales. No, so UV okay. was much higher actually. So. so we did not actually catch the entire the top part of the flare. So X-ray was, I think. About uh, twenty See, or something. X-ray has two changes. X-ray has heat photons and the corona. Yeah. So change in X-ray doesn't tell you exactly what is changing in the disk. You rather look at the UV. So that is directly from the disk. Yes. So in UV, the change is not more than a factor of one, factor of two. Because in optical, it's thirty percent. So how much can the UV be? I can I can actually yeah, yeah. check this thing. So this is anyway. My point is even if this is slightly more, even if this is factor of three, four, whatever, that is not very uncommon. Right? That's yeah. the same. So this is just from AGN variability you see. Normal AGN that's the variable. What is so special about this? Special about this? Means AG the appearance is not giving me anything, any new information about it. It's just half size increase. So I can see that. This emission line as well. But it tells us about the something is changing in the DLR, right? The DLR, uh, I mean, the DLR is so that is no, but about. that is not explained by the continuum variation. Right. So that kind of continuum variation happens all the time. That's what I'm trying to say. Okay. I don't know whether the, 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 the thing, the flux, I mean, the picture that you showed, the figure, Which where one? you had the drop of the LP, the electron, etc. Before yes. that. Yeah. Yeah, that one. Maybe the green and the blue. Yeah. The previous one. Yeah. What is the factor of uh, flux change? So, uh, X-ray the uh, lower limit is twenty. This is optical, right? And this is the <coughs> less than five thousand. So that's optical. Yeah, so what is the factor of flux change? Let's say it's like factor of four, five. So here, in the optical. Here, that's not much, but where when the H beta. The so it beta appears. Right. So we actually so can't we, no, we actually couldn't con compare that because this one was a count spectrum. So I just did it for plotting. So oh. you had you had nothing here in the signal to noise, you don't see a 
broad emission lens. Okay, so then, no, I, I'll talk, I can talk about it later, but I am asking that, are you claiming that this change in X-ray, optical, UV, whatever you say, is this change a very uncommon change for an AGN or a rather common change for an AGN? I would say it's uncommon because it's a factor of okay, 10. Okay. So let's we'll talk about that. And why do you think that it is not so uncommon? Because the plastic. No, we'll talk about it. Just please put yeah. it. Just please put see it. I mean, the line is going up. And That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about continuum. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Uh, so that's. So that's all. Um, I think I have. Okay. Again, okay. okay. that, that's the uh, questions. Yeah. This one? Uh, no, no, but yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. no, this previous yeah, we did it for the next one. Okay, later. Okay, uh, now I talk about a completely different kind of changing into AGN, which is uh, which underwent four decades of monitoring. So in so this is Mercury and 1018 in 1979. So this source was a type 1 one. And in 19, between 1984 to 2000, 2009, uh, this source was a type 1. Yeah. And then when it was observed again after 2015, this has reverted back to type 1. one. So here is some uh, some spectra. So you see that how the source has changed in different uh, in the different monitoring periods, and it was already studied very well with one of with, with multiple in multiple papers. And uh, this is an unobscured source, as the extra spectrum suggests. And what we do here is a much more deeper study of uh, the source again with, with physical modeling of the X-ray spectra and the variability uh, trends that are shown in multiple bands. So in type one, so we, we have archival spectra from uh, from different epochs uh, and there is, a, there is a lot, there is uh, mostly a monitoring, a continuous monitoring for from 2005, which up to up to 2021, and all these spectra show us all analysis of all the spectra show us uh, the characteristics that changes characteristic changes of the extra spectrum over the over the changing of the gene drop. So we have the bright type one phase spectrum here, which exhibits a very really a kind of strong soft axis initially, and then. In the in the type 1.9 phase, we see that the soft excess kind of disappears slowly. And here in the final spectrum, it's mostly an upper limit. So it's modeled, so we model this using a three-component model. So we have the uh, comp TT, uh, which is the uh, which, which is the model of the soft excess here. And then there is uh, the Z power law, which is the corona, and then the a distant reflection. Component which is which comes from UX Plumpy, which is a distant torus reflection. <laughs> so all this, this all so detailed study studying uh, shows significant changes in the hard power law, and uh, and uh, so we and it has a definite trend that's shown here. So on the top panel, you have uh, you have the UV flux from uh, XMM Newton uh, optical monitor and uh, and the Swift UBOT. On in the middle panel, you have the X-ray flux, and here we have the variation of the photon index, which initially was at a higher level, and then there was a bit of flattening and then a recovery. So this is an interesting trend. So this happens in a time scale of uh, so this monitoring, this monitoring as I present here it happens in a time scale of almost a decade, and 
this, this transient drop and gap and the gamma gamma, gamma transition it happens within uh, a few years it's one to three years also we find there is a response of the iron line which is uh, which is not as strong as the continuum but uh, it it all exhibits almost a similar drop as shown here so we model this we also model this with a distant reflection model and we were able to constrain the parameters the ex exterior and the in ex external radius and inter internal radius of the uh, of the iron line emitter <coughs> so here i show i present a multi multi band uh, variability spectrum so on the why on the vertical axis you see the ratio of the flux change between the type one and the type two uh, phase in each at each energies, and here we have the energy. So what we find that the UV has varied by a factor of twenty seven, whereas the X ray has varied by a factor of only eight. The soft excess, the soft X ray region varied varied more than the hard X ray region by a factor of 20, and the soft excess component varied by a factor of 30. And the reflection and iron line varied least, which is uh, an evidence evidence of uh, distance, distance reflection, distance processing. So this is an indication of uh, the UV driving the, di driving the extra variability. So on top, we have the broadband modeling, broadband AGM, the, spec, the AGM spectra obtained from broadband modeling, we see that with time, the soft excess and the warm corona, uh, warm corona contribution to the spectrum has decreased uh, ultimately in the, in the final spectrum as shown. Uh, so this is, so here I present the, variation of uh, the hard x-ray power law with respect to uh, with respect to accretion rate with uh, accretion rate and uh, we find that there is a distinct phase transition in the bright bright state and in the phase state so in the bright state there is not much of a trend but in the faint, faint state state we find that there is a softer when fainter uh, Paint a trend uh, in the in the in a photon index uh, photon index uh, parameter. So this is actually something ex similar that's shown in black hole X-ray binaries. So one of the sources that have been monitored con consistently over long term is this one. So you see that there is a, there is a, a si reversal of trend at least. Which in the faint phase, that is below 10 to the accretion rate of 10 to the minus 2. And this is somewhat, and that, this means that our source variability is somewhat analogous to that of uh, that of uh, black hole binaries. Also, this is similar to what we see in uh, samples of AGMs. So in different samples, we see that so uh, we see that during a phase, uh, during a phase transition, Transition change uh, type during a changing look event. Uh, so the the trend has changed in in one of the more important one of the parameters, which is the X ray UV X ray spectral index, which is almost representative of uh, of our photon indices here. So overall, so uh, this is a sum up of uh, the changing look uh, mechanism that might be driving. Uh, all, all, in at least most uh, changing look AGMs over different time scales. So, uh, at low at lower accretion rates, so, so accretion disk inner regions of the accretion disk are dominated by uh, radi radiation pressure. Radiation pressure is much more uh, dominant than gas pressure, which mean which results in some sort of instabilities. So, since this was proposed initially by Lightman and Yardley. So in Markarian 1018, which this extreme variability, it is, it, so it can be characterized as a high state for almost uh, 30 years. And then there is a drop. 
So this drop happens in a thermal time scale, and we can characterize this, characterize the radius from where this might has might have happened using some alpha parameter, alpha or viscosity parameter, and uh, the 30 years of the type one state is it's inconsistent with the with a thin disk approximation. So thin thin disk is thin disk varies in a much more uh, it's in a much longer time scales, much longer viscous time scales. However, this can be this viscous time scale can be reduced when we uh, assume some sort of thick disk and in and in, uh, in unstable disks like this. However, if you remember the the LIDA source that I told before, it varied in a by in a uh, just uh, within forty days. So thus we come up with two different questions. So is it the same mechanism which drives this uh, large scale flux changes over large time scales, or this is uh, so if and if there is some different sort of mechanism that drives this? So possible mechanisms can be radiation pressure instabilities, H instabilities, and maybe combination of many. So overall, so this is the final slide. So this Compton thick. Uh, study makes a case for future observatories such as Athena, Hex Peak, which has higher effective area, which means you have more photons distributed over multiple degrees of freedom. That's more resolution. And then we also kind of understand the need for uh, from the from the changing of Asian uh, uh, studies, understand the need for much more rigorous simulations, which can uh, simulate different sorts of layers in uh, different, given different types of disk parameters. And also it calls for more uh, rig uh, more uh, consistent monitoring campaigns so that we can catch these events in, uh, regularly to verify the model that's, uh, that's, uh, that's uh, that we calculate, so yeah. Yes. Okay, Oliver, now you can ask the question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah.